I'm very honored and excited to introduce today's speaker, CBU organizer Alicia Rivera. Alicia has been doing community organizing in various low income poor communities in LA since being El Salvador at the end of 1980. She first got, got involved in the struggle to obtain refuge status for Salvadorans in the US who like her fled El Salvador in mass to survive the government repression in the long civil war that lasted 12 years. Then Alicia transitioned to environmental and economic justice organizing in low income communities throughout LA in issues of tenant rights, community benefits, housing projects and environmental justice. Organizing within the campaign to make the former spectacle Wilmington Refinery accountable to the community for its large explosion made Alicia realize that US corporations discriminate against low income people in the US and abroad. Texaco was polluting the predominantly Latino and low income population in the Port of LA area while in Ecuador, Texaco contaminated the water and soil of indigenous populations in the rainforest and refused to clean it up. She currently works as a community organizer for Communities for a Better Environment, CBE, a 40-year-old environmental justice organization that organizes and empowers frontline residents in the Bay and LA area to achieve environmental health and justice by preventing and reducing pollution and building green, healthy, and sustainable communities and environments. If any of our audience members have questions throughout the event, feel free to drop them in the chat and Alicia will answer them if there is time. And if not, we will save them for our Q&A session. Thank you so much, Alicia, for being here today. Good morning. Uh, thank you. Uh, let me start by um, sharing. CBE is an environmental health and justice organization working in the communities of Southeast Los Angeles, Wilmington, East Oakland, and Richmond, California. A little bit about CBE and what we do. And I'm gonna share screen again. Good morning, my name is Alicia Rivera and I am with CBE Communities for a Better Environment. I am a community organizer in the city of Wilmington, that's in the Port of Los Angeles. And um, CBE builds people power. We organize in the communities where we, uh, where people are the most impacted by pollution uh, we work to prevent and reduce pollution and build green, healthy, and sustainable communities. Uh, CVE has been organizing for 40 years uh, in communities of color. <clears throat> we were founded in 1978. One is we one of the. Uh, uh, we are a preeminent environmental justice organization in the nation. And for two decades, we've been organizing in fence line communities such as the one I'm gonna talk about today, Wilmington. Uh, those are people that are living uh, next to oil refineries, neighborhood oil drilling sites and other industries that emit toxics. We work to secure stringent regulations and policies that protect community health and advance green alternatives in our communities. We do this through our trial model, which is grassroots organizing from the ground up. We also use science-based research and we have lawyers that create legal strategies. I'm gonna be presenting and talking about uh, the area where I organize in Wilmington. Uh, that's near the Port of Los Angeles. Uh, it's known as a fossil fuel sacrifice zone, and I will show you why. Uh, it's a, a perfect case of environmental injustice and environmental racism because 
95% uh, of the people uh, are of color out of a total population of over 52,000. Uh, there are several schools uh, in a kind of like a 20 square school as uh, mile. Um, the current virus screen maps shows that is 96 percentile the highest toxics and in the four census tracts in 96 to 100 most disadvantaged communities. There is high asthma rates and other socioeconomic burden like being low income, uh, issues with education, language barriers, um, a lot of the people um, speak mostly just Spanish. This is a look of the Port of Los Angeles. So that creates a tremendous amount of traffic per hour, per day. And of course, all these diesel emissions that are used in this um, transportation impacts uh, Wilmington residents' health. There is also uh, oil drilling, not just the refining, but the oil extraction and gas extraction. And as you can see here, the oil derricks and tanks are just across from people's home. In fact, you can see it, they just right over the roofs. I took this photo here and this is just across the street. Uh, this is a, a neighborhood. Um, there is a purse, the house right here, you can see, you, the, you can see the, the top of the houses um, one street over. And the person that lives on the other side of the fence here, um, last I talked to her before the pandemic, they had cut half of her lawn. She had lived there for many years. Wilmington is in um, Council District 15. This is a nice picture of Wilmington. Um, there are 476 active, active wells. And there are more than in any other city in the whole LA region. So it's very impacted. This photo is of high school students. Uh, practicing every day. You can see how they are surrounded by oil pumps. And let me get out of this. Drill sites are known to cause hydrogen sulfide emissions. It's toxic to humans, even at low concentration. The oil industry is the largest industrial source of volatile organic compounds emissions known as VOCs. It's one of the key components of smog. All these emissions affect primarily the reproductive system. So women and children are the most impacted by some 23 chemicals that I use in oil and gas extraction. These chemicals are known to cause endocrine disrupting effects that impact the reproductive system in infertility. And it could cause increased risk of miscarriage and um, birth defects early turn defect uh, and children are especially susceptible because they breathe faster. So they take in much more of this emission. Uh, this is a map by the Air Quality Management District that regulates refineries and uh, oil extraction. And these are the plumes uh, shows average oil refinery emissions. 
These are all the refineries in the area of Wilmington or, or the South Bay. But these ones here, five of them, are the ones that are located in proximity of the residential areas in Wilmington, five. You can see the plumes uh, overlap. And of course, the impact on the health is more potent. The area is known as Wilmington, Carson, and West Long Beach because they are um, close to one another. And the three are ground zero in the state for oil refinery impact. As I said, there are five refinery is a complex in Wilmington and in its borders of Carson and West Long Beach. These five refineries have a capacity of 600,000 barrels a day uh, production. That's about one third of the state capacity for refining. Refineries are very close to the residential areas. You can see this humongous complex of refinery pretty much where one stop, the other one continues. This example here in this great photograph taken by a photographer um, that allow us to keep this picture, you can see this is one of the five refineries, the Phillips 66. Um, there is a cinder block here separating this packet of neighborhood from the facility. That same refinery is also very close to an elementary school and to Harvard College. This is what the children experience. Pretty much um, regularly. So with five refineries, having refinery flares, fires, explosion can happen at any time. This is what students uh, mostly are familiar with the flaring. Of course, they um, they can the air can get really hard to breathe and therefore athletes on the campuses reported that they refrain from practicing sports on days when the air quality is really bad so it really affects the quality of life while there are extreme levels of diesel truck emission due to the port activities the air district the regulators found that refineries are the largest source of many small constituencies in wilmington for example, uh, volatile organic compounds, the largest contributors to BOC emissions are refineries, particular matter, which is uh, very tiny particles that are breathed into the lungs, comes mostly from petrochemical processes and from combustion, traffic, burning of fossil fuels. And that can also cause premature death and also nitrogen oxide, NOx. Um, refinery operation are the second largest source, including the units that uh, recover sulfur or re remove sulfur from the, um, from the crude. In 2017, refineries were seven of 10 largest cap and trade total greenhouse gas sources. If you have heard about cap and trade, it's the program that lets polluters buy and trade pollution credits to evade reducing their emissions. And this is the list of the seven refineries. You can see that um, only two are oil and gas production from those uh, found um, in cup and tray, these two. One is cement and the other ones are all refineries. The highlighted ones here, this one is in Wilmington <clears throat> and these other ones are in the South Bay. One is called in El Segundo and the other one is in the city of Torrance, which is 
only a couple of miles away from there. So this is very regular uh, when living in a refinery town. You would think that with all this pollution um, would be enough. However, the regulators still allow the expansion of one of the refineries called Tesoro. Tesoro allowed more fossil fuel infrastructure in Wilmington with increased health hazard and pollution. They described the project of uh, the expansion also known as a merger of two refineries as the cleaner project. But even the draft environmental impact report said that BOCs and hazards would increase. It was not a cleaner project. It, this would create major cracking unit expansions. These are the cracking units that um, are used in refineries. There are also major expansion of heaters and boilers, which are the ones that are pretty much the soul of refineries to put um, the high pressure um, for uh, this, this distilling the, uh, the products they make. And of course, they, um, they created dozens of new connections to existing players. Also, this project um, would add more storage tank. Here is a picture. Imagine this picture was taken. Um, these people here, these men at the base of the uh, storage tank, just to give you an idea how humongous they would be. So they would be putting six new uh, capacity of half a million barrel each, plus two more capacity of 300,000 barrels each. Um, the new tanks capacity is 3.4 million barrels. That's almost what the existing capacity already of the refinery, almost double the crude oil storage. And what do they want to put in this storage? Refineries have been salivating to get new crude, uh, frac crude, dutier crude, such as from North Dakota um, and from uh, Canada. The, the Tarzan, uh, if people are, have heard about um, the boom in North Dakota, uh, of fracking, extracting, um, uh, you know, material, and that creates major methane emission. It has created water pollution and air toxics. And in Canada, uh, they're going to street mine in pristine land to get this type of tar uh, sands bitumen. And that requires large wa uh, volumes of water and produces toxic lakes, river, and fish contamination. We organize against the expansion. And when in 2017, after the Air Quality Management District approved the Tesoro expansion, thousands of people marched to the gates of Tesoro on People's Climate March. It didn't matter because the Air District still ignored us and approved the project. Of course, this fossil fuel expansion and extracting duty crude, as we know, causes high greenhouse gases, known as the greenhouse effect. And of course, fossil fuel use has to stop if we want to stop global warming events that cause devastation in climate refugees, in um, flooding, wildfires, and um, no rain. We are organizing and pushing for solutions uh, through pushing our regulators uh, 
pushing for policies that reduce pollution, trying to get uh, cleaner energy, solar and wind, and organizing the communities where we work at so that they can participate. Uh, we build power by uh, organizing and training people in Wilmington and other areas where we are working so they can be part of the decision making to make refineries accountable. So far we have staffed many fossil fuel power plants. We also want uh, pollution prevention measures that cut greenhouse gases and smog and toxics such as regulations to stop the use of flaring regularly. Uh, and we also have been working so to so refineries can use what is called best available control technology to capture emissions that otherwise would go into the air we breathe. We sued the city of Los Angeles because they were simply rubber stamping um, permits for oil extraction and gas extraction with no conditions. And we pushed them to establish a new oil drilling application process. Our goal is to phase out fossil fuels, replacing uh, oil with transportation electrification. And we're working for a just transition plan that supports oil workers once we are facing out these uh, fossil fuel projects and refineries and oil extraction. Um, that would include uh, investment in job creation programs and workforce development for hydro jobs in the new economy that is cleaner. We want to stop green, uh, stop green crude oil like tar sands immediately. We need to stop fracking and fracking like activities and we need to add 2500 foot setback uh, in the meantime to protect people from living so close to these activities. We need to stop the California cap and trade program in the whole US. It doesn't work. It allows refineries to evade reducing emissions. We are um, we're planning for a just transition refinery phase out, including drilling, gasoline, diesel phase out by 2050, which has been proven feasible through vehicle electrification. And we are working for no drilling where we're living or campaign to phase out oil drilling in Wilmington and the city of LA is on our way. We want to phase out fossil fuel because we know the technology is already there, but first we have to stop expanding while we phase out oil drilling and refineries. Studies by UC Berkeley prove that we can phase out fossil fuels economically by increasing energy efficiency to reduce the amount of energy we need in our homes. We need to replace natural gas and coal electricity power plant with zero emission renewables, such as solar and wind. Electrify our transportation that would, you know, that would get rid of gas, diesel, crude oil. We also need equitable access to clean energy, especially in refinery towns for low income communities so that they can do it through distributed solar and so they can afford economic electric vehicles, uh, transit, public transit and charging stations. We also need community resiliency such as gardens, green space, food security, healthy communities, equitable and community-based solutions. Lasting solution happened from the ground up with the participation and leadership of residents and workers most directly affected by pollution and environmental degradation. The struggle for environmental justice is intrinsic to movement for social justice in the US and throughout the world. CBE envisions a society in which production and consumption are based on environmental and social sustainability which is held as a basic human right to breathe clean air and drink clean water in the environment where we live, work, go to school, 
play and pray, regardless of race, gender, sexual orientation, age, cultural ability, nationality, or income. I hope this presentation was helpful in painting a picture of what environmental racism and, and environmental injustice in communities of colors look like. We hope you contact us about getting involved or if you would like to have a toxic tour of Wilmington, uh, contact me, Alicia Rivera, and this is our website that I hope you can visit. Now we um, will take any questions or comments. Yeah, thank you so much for that incredible presentation. It was really insightful, Alicia. Um, so again, at this time, we'd like to just invite our audience to keep dropping any questions that you might have for Alicia in the chat, um, or if you're comfortable, you can raise your hand and we'll call on you to um, ask your question for everyone to hear. Any comments? Let me try to... Um, I guess just to get the um, the ball rolling, um, I guess one question that we had was, what can members of the audience, including those in the Upper Valley, since it's so far away, still do to support the work of EB CBE and other environmental justice organizations in fighting against environmental racism by oil refineries? I'm having a difficult time getting out of here. Okay, here I am. Um, yeah, well, you know, we, um, there is a lot that people can do. We're always in need of support when we're trying to lobby legislators on bills. Uh, for example, at the moment, uh, just to mention quickly, we're trying to add two more uh, governing board members to the air quality management district that approve the Tesoro expansion. Most of the members of the air quality management district now are really, they, they could be working for the oil industry. They are like a mouthpiece and they rubber stamp everything. So we need members uh, such as the concept of adding members to the Supreme Court, you know, so that they can work for our interests. We wanna add a couple more members to the governing board so that they represent the interests of the environmental justice community. That's a bill that is now um, <clears throat> at, in legislation in committee. And of course, we're always pushing for other bills uh, like to get rid of fossil, uh, of oil drill extraction or drilling uh, for oil and gas in California. So um, I will, um, my contact information is there and if people, would like uh, us to put them on our mailing list, please put it on the chat and I will take your name. And also if uh, Jimena uh, could take that information as well to make it available and I can contact people. Yeah, so we'll make sure to include that in our follow-up email for this event, Alicia. Um, just to add on, I'm gonna ask another question. So. When we were developing this series, we kept in mind that LA is only one of the millions of other locations across the country and in the world where the effects of environmental, recent, uh, environmental racism is felt and so evident. So what are some of the global impacts of oil refineries that you've observed, seen throughout your organizing in CBE? Yeah, um, of course, you know, Whatever happens in any community doesn't stay there, especially if it's uh, fossil fuel emission. As we know, they are impacting the whole world. If we don't stop that, um, we're gonna continue to have wildfires, such as what we see in California, for those of you that are in California. And you know, in other areas, it's just uh, uh, storm after storm, uh, hurricanes, and what happens is that all that, um, all that people that loses their, uh, their, their homes or their areas of work or if places are inundated with water, what happens is that it creates all those refugees that are gonna need housing, are gonna need food that are not gonna be coming out of that area anymore. And of course that increases everybody's uh, 
you know, cost of living in terms of food and uh, food security and housing. So this is, uh, we, we uh, uh, at the moment have been uh, in alliance with co something called grassroots, grassroots Global Justice. It's an alliance that uh, brings together uh, people from different areas in the world, from Guatemala, from Guam, from Puerto Rico, you know, that have been devastated by, uh, by storms and hurricanes, as we know, uh, to see how we can work together um, in uh, involving uh, the community so that they be part of the decision. Because what happened is that if people that are the most impacted are not part of the decision-making process, um, you know, they can come and, uh, um, you know, displace them to put something like a dam, supposedly to create uh, energy. That's not a good solution. So, um, so we're definitely working uh, nationwide and globally to, um, to bring together, you know, to push for a clean energy. Does anybody else have any other questions? Um, I guess one other question that we had was, um, what can we do to make sure that corporations stop mislabeling environmentally toxic pursuits as clean like Tesoro did? Good question. Um, <laughs> you know, it's very difficult if you don't have the staff like we do. Um, you know, we have technical expertise that can um, analyze those, the, the, the lingo, and, and the writing and the hundreds of pages that paint these projects as clean. Um, so, you know, linking or uh, contacting organizations such as Communities for a Better Environment, which is how we get involved, residents contact us when they have an issue and we get involved. So it's so important that communities uh, have access to organizations such as us, and we need to exist. So we need funding. As you know, that's a, uh, we are a nonprofit, and we we don't get a, a, a dime or or a nothing from the refineries. They would like to give us funding, because that's what they do. They give funding to the churches, to the schools, to the uh, YMCA's, so that everybody they can put a gag on them, so that they don't speak out. Uh, and so, um, so it, you know, I would say that contacting organizations, environmental justice organizations uh, that are involved is how communities um, can get the help to analyze this project because they have uh, so much money for publicity uh, that uh, it confuses people that this is going to be good for them, especially that is going to create jobs, you know, and so we need to, uh, we talk with community members and tell them, you know, these jobs in the long run, they cost a lot to us because they create uh, pollution for the environment, for the air we breathe, for the water we drink, and for our health. So in the long run, these jobs are very expensive and we need cleaner jobs. We, you know, they, 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 right now the green energy is catching up faster in terms of providing employment uh, and, and being part of the economy than the fossil fuel. So right now you're gonna see in the news that the um, fossil fuel, uh, the refineries, and uh, they are switching supposedly into biofuel because they see the writing in the wall, for example, through, throughout this pandemic, they really hurt. They couldn't sell, no one was driving. So they, you know, their, their bottom line dropped uh, a, lot, a, a lot during the pandemic. So, you know, what are they gonna do when, uh, when what their emission is causing inundating with water or uh, uh, earthquakes? So, um, they are switching to something else also called capture, uh, uh, carbon capture, which is also not a good solution because why do you need to capture the carbon? It's better not stop creating it, right? Otherwise we continue um, with the status quo. Um, I 
I guess another question that we had was um, if you could talk a little bit more about the work that CBE is doing to push forward green energy jobs as part of environmental justice for oil workers and other workers in environmentally toxic um, employment. Right. For example, we are very close to winning an ordinance that would phase out oil, uh, oil extraction and gas extraction in the city of Los Angeles. After like six, seven years of organizing, we finally getting very close to getting an, an ordinance at City Hall. And so um, that's going to be a um, a, a plan phase out that's not going to happen within the next three years. They, they have something called a moratorium or an amortis, amortization period uh, for each side so that it analyzes how you can start to uh, shut down, uh, you know, uh, through, a, you know, within a period of so many years. And so what's going to happen with those workers? We are working so that there is funding, first of all, so that there is funding from those polluters to clean up those sites they're going to abandon so that it's not to the, to the taxpayers, you know, to clean that. Uh, the pipes and everything, the soil that is going to be polluted, we can put um, uh, low income housing there or parks. And so we also are pushing so that there is this polluters contribute to a, a, an economic fund where these workers can be retrained. And so we also need funding so that our community colleges have programs to retrain for other, you know, for, for anything else. I heard that in uh, Canada, it, you know, for every displaced worker, they train it and look around what fields are in need of workers. For example, what have we needed during the pandemic is nurses, right? And doctors. So if you can train for a, a demand uh, that, that is available, then you will have a, a job that is not in fossil fuel. So definitely we're working for all those details. Yes, and I know you were mentioning a little bit about how oil refineries are getting away with a lot because of the pandemics and a lot of and the, the way they use this very like confusing la language. So I wanted to ask, how have you noticed the pandemics affect organizing and work around oil refineries? How has this manifested or how, what possibilities have been opened up through everything being virtual for organizing around oil refineries? You know what, it was, I was so worried that because my job is go door to door, talking to people, uh, you know, and, and having meetings. And I was so worried that I wasn't gonna be able to do that. But guess what? The participation has increased during the pandemic. And a lot of people who were in, didn't even, had not even heard about Zoom. Uh, now they are using Zoom and they have from one meeting to another. So we've been very busy. I have every meeting I have every week, I have at least 20 members. And uh, because the city of Los Angeles and California has been so supportive of uh, providing, making sure that there is a moratorium on, on, on rent and making sure that uh, people have have food, you know, they have provided uh, food banks uh, so people have been able to sustain themselves throughout the pandemic. And so they have been able to participate. Uh, and so that's not the same in other states, I know, that are not as compassionate and uh, accountable and, uh, you know, to their population. But um, we're very happy. We have, a, you know, community members have attended uh, uh, official uh, public hearings, they have testified, and they have called elected officials. We've been very busy, and you know what? Uh, I am afraid of going back to uh, in-person meetings, because I don't know if I'm going to have the same attendance. <laughs> so it's been really, really interesting. We definitely have not stopped pushing for a setback, and uh, we haven't uh, stopped, uh, you know, lobbying the, uh, the elected officials in the bills that we want passed in committee. And uh, of course, as alliances, we also 
have been able to organize, continue to organize and reach out to our members, make them, uh, you know, give them that uh, sometimes we have helped them so that they can have uh, internet connection so that they can participate. And we have even provided them with computers so that they can get online. You know, we get them all these donated. We also had a fund, an economic fund where we uh, provided some economic support to people throughout this pandemic. So we, I feel that we are coming out of this uh, quite positive. Thank you. Um, I just noticed one of our audience members, Jorge Cuellar, wanted to drop a question. He said, can you tell us a bit more on how your experience of the Salvadoran Civil War and how its legacies inform your thinking and political organizing in environmental justice in Los Angeles? Yeah, you know, I, I, uh, on the, this past administration, um, you know, the hate for immigrants and uh, the bigotry for immigrants and the discrimination, and of course, all these migrations that are on, at the border, you know, reminded me again when I left. Uh, that was the civil war between the uh, guerrillas and the, and the government. Uh, because it started when pe because people uh, right to organize, right to protest, right to ask for for uh, better conditions started to be repressed by the government. And what happened is that the United States government started supporting that government that was suppressing all human rights, that was disappearing people, that was arresting people and torturing them. The U.S. was there to support the government with military and economic aid. They were spending one million a day in economic and in weapons to that government. So we saw thousands fled, and we wouldn't we wouldn't be accepted here for political asylums. We were deported. Why? Because. When you're supporting a government, it's because you support, you think that they're doing good. But if you start to uh, give political asylum to the people fleeing that, that government, then you're saying, well, maybe that government is not too good. Maybe we shouldn't be investing in them. So that's why we were being deported. And what's happening now, well, I got into organizing because somehow, when I made it through the border through a coyote, what, you know, somebody who got me across for pay, um, I had, I suffered a lot here. I, I, I ended up on the street. I couldn't afford an apartment. And uh, I wind up being supported uh, by Lutheran Social Services. And um, I had, I had some English and there were so many people coming to ask for help that I started helping to translate. And I started to see that people were telling me, my son was disappeared and I can't find him. They killed my daughter. They, you know, and so um, the, the, somehow I started to give presentation about why I left and what I was hearing to people to let them, uh, to ask them to do something so that this government would stop sending aid to that government that was making people flee. Yet they didn't want us here. Right now, what you see, and that's how I started to get involved. Eventually, I I got involved with, with uh, asking, you know, pushing for asylum for refugees that were fleeing war and persecution and uh, torture. And eventually I transitioned into environmental organizing when I found out there was a, the, one of the refineries in Wilmington, uh, the Tesoro was called Texaco at the time. So I read uh, an organization called the Rainforest uh, Action Network, they had a campaign because in Ecuador, the Texaco had polluted the rivers and the rainforests of the native people. 
And here in Wilmington, which is predominantly Latino, they had an explosion there. And so they were discriminating there and discriminating here to communities of color and poor. And so I realized that these corporations, uh, they act transnationally and globally. And that's how I became involved in that uh, accountability campaign against Texaco. And that's, I, I'm still here because the most important thing we can do is stop these corporations from displacing people, from polluting their natural resources and rendering all this water and soil uh, useless. What these people gonna do? They're gonna have to go to the north and they're gonna be across the border asking to be allowed in like we have now. They're not only from El Salvador and from Honduras and from Guatemala. What's happening with these people? I see the videos, no rain. They can't afford to, uh, to do the regular plantations that they've been doing the agriculture to sustain themselves because there is no water. So what happens? They have to flee and they are right there. They are right now, they are environmental refugees. It's because of the policies of this country Look, they've been supporting Honduras. Honduras are most of the people at the, on the other side of the border. This president is getting all this money from the US, but is repressing the people, is killing the people, is not using all that money to help the people to stop them from fleeing. That is what's happening, unfortunately. Thank you so much for sharing that perspective, Alicia. Um, just a, a kind of to start wrapping up the conversation, we also want to talk about like the intersectionality of these events, which is something that you've definitely hinted on. Um, and so I wanted to ask, um, what work is CBE doing to protect the health of those who are living in close proximity to oil refineries and drilling sites? But also, what kind of connections do you see between the fact that these are predominantly communities of color and the environmental racism present there, the police brutality, and housing segregation in these areas? Well, just like uh, environmental refugees that have to flee, there is that happening here where there is communities of color. That I'm talking about Black, Latino, and of color, other uh, communities. They, they are putting all this pollution in their neighborhood. They're, you're not gonna find uh, any green areas there. Uh, there is food insecurity and, and desert. And so we've been pushing so that clean up these communities from uh, making this uh, uh, not only refineries, but also uh, battery recyclers called Exide. Uh, if anyone uh, have heard about it, they recycle uh, car batteries for years. Yet they pollute, you know, all that uh, that came out of, you know, the lead. So right now, <clears throat> the facility has a uh, bankrupt. And so what happened now, we have to pay to clean up all that pollution they left in Vernon and in Southgate and in Huntington Park. And so what happens is that uh, we organize all these communities, everyone, and we are also trying to, we also support Black Lives Matter because we believe that, um, you know, there has to be uh, human rights and there has to be all that money that now is going to uh, the police to repress people, you know, from uh, protesting uh, the killing of innocent black uh, men, especially and women, that we need to use that money differently uh, so that we can invest in programs that support uh, these communities and this uh, for mental health and and for uh, uh, for housing especially because what's creating a lot of the homeless is that people cannot afford anymore to rent an apartment and we're also pushing for uh, decent wages that people can afford to have a house you know uh, to uh, to live on. And so definitely we are forging all these alliances with all colors. 
so that we are stronger and so that there is no also misunderstanding, uh, you know, that they that unify in the communities in one common, you know, everything is economic justice and social justice. Yes, thank you so much, Alicia, for sharing. I've learned so much. You have so much wisdom. And thank you for being vulnerable and sharing your stories. Um, since we are going to start wrapping up the event, we'd like to give you a couple of minutes just to say any last few words. Um, thank you again so much for being here. Well, I really appreciate uh, CBE being invited to participate and having a chance to get to you know, whoever is listening so that you can understand why is it that we need to uh, shut down and phase out fossil fuel? It's not only that it's affecting the communities where they are located, these extraction uh, companies are located. This is spreading, uh, creating climate change for everyone. And we are all going to be affected in the long run for food security, for uh, environmental degradation. And uh, of course, um, you know, my, my hope is that I have been able to paint a picture of why it is necessary to get involved, uh, you know, to be participant, not just uh, a viewer, you know, uh, we, we need to get involved uh, because our future, depends of what we do now. And I think students have an opportunity. I know that the students are very busy, but you can still participate, signing petitions, attending demonstrations, uh, uh, lobbying through, um, you know, online when, when there are uh, policies being pushed. Uh, so there is a lot that you can do and also you know, look at fine uh, videos about uh, environmental issues and talk to other people, talk to your relatives, talk to your uh, 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 friends and try to uh, cultivate other people, you know, to get in involved in this uh, new economy that is, it needs to be clean if, if, it's, if we are to survive. So thank you so much. And if anyone wants to uh, contact me, um, please do. I will be so glad to hear from you. Thank you so much again, Alicia. We'll be sure to link your email as well and the action items that we send out after this event. And thank you all to our audience so much for joining us in this event and all of the events of our series um, Crossroads. We truly appreciate all of your support and engagement and these important, important discussions on environmental intersectionality with housing injustice, racial inequality, police brutality, and energy racism. Um, and if you'd like to rewatch or watch any of these events in the series that you missed, um, you can find the recordings on our website, which is posted um, in the chat We'll post them in the chat um, and is linked in the email with the Zoom link to our events. Um, and so um, you can, we'll, we're still uploading some of the other recordings, but they'll definitely be up soon. Um, and thank you all again so much for joining us. And we continue to definitely, um, we encourage you to continue these critical conversations on environmental justice in the future. Have a great day, everyone. <laughs>